All right, that's good. So thank you for your patience uh, and for your kindness this evening. Let's take our Bibles and turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter number 3. And we'll continue on tonight. We're preaching somewhat through the book. Uh, and then, <laughs> you know, using it as a springboard for uh, thoughts about family life. How to, how to um, grow in our relationship with our wife and husbands and, you know, trying to grow in that. And last week, uh, we looked at this uh, thing here. I got too much stuff going on. In uh, 1 Thessalonians, but remember in, verse, in chapter 3, uh, the idea there was Paul loved those people at Thessalonica and he wrote to them and he actually was away from them and he sent uh, Timothy to them because he, he had to know, man, are they still staying firm in the foundation or, you know, is the tempter tempting them and the persecution, is it getting to them? And he gets the reply back from Timothy and, and it's a good report that no, they're, they're staying strong, they're doing what's right. And so Paul writes that, uh, verse number 7, he says this, Therefore, brethren, we were comforted over you in all our affliction and distress by your faith. For now we live if ye stand fast in the Lord. And so what a truth, and it's simple, but it's the truth. Your steadfastness, your faithfulness can absolutely, positively uh, influence in a, in a great manner other brothers and sisters around you, other Christians around you can 100% be encouraged by your faithfulness. And so I took that thought and tried to apply it to our marriages and said, you know, your wife can absolutely be encouraged if, if you as a husband are being a man of God. And we looked a little bit about that uh, last week, we said the head of every man is Christ. He is the leader of the home. Therefore, the husband, the man of God, is supposed to set the direction that his family is to follow. Uh, Abraham was such a man. He was very predictable. And, you know, we, great men are, are great in little things. And so we looked at, at, at fellas. And so I didn't really get to the application, but I'll just say it right now tonight. Hey, guys, are you a man of God? Fellas, are there areas in our life that need constant attention? Absolutely. We never arrive. None of us in here as men, and no matter how mature we become in the faith, we're never going to get to the place where, oh, yeah, I don't need to work on my marriage anymore. I've got it. Now, maybe Michael Holt gets there, but the rest of us, we, we're going to have to keep working, ain't it? But, you know, seriously, we've got to keep, we're going to always have to work on that. Can we be better husbands? Can God, mm, this was convicting to me, can God look down at your life and say this, I know him, that he will command his children and his family to follow in the ways of God. See, he did. When he looked down at Abraham, he said those words, I know him, that he will command his children and his ho household after him. He could look at Abraham and say, I know, I know what Abraham will do. I know he'll cause his family to follow me. Can guys, can he look down at you tonight and say, I know old Danny, I know old Zach, I know old Jimmy, I know those guys, I know what they'll do. Pray that God could look at our lives and say, no, I know, I know he'll, he'll command his family. So I want to encourage men, be men of God. And then we'll land tonight on the other side of the relationship where the, the, the wives and the truth is this, a wife needs to be a woman of God. I mean, be a woman of God. Just like the husband, if he will do what's right and serve God and let Christ be the head and let him follow his leadership, that will be such an encouragement uh, to your wife. If the wife will be a woman of God, that will encourage her husband uh, tremendously. And so, well, what does it look like to be a woman of God? Well, uh, look briefly over there at 1 Peter chapter number 3. 1 Peter chapter number 3. 1 Peter chapter number 3. And the Bible says this, Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that 
if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives. What he's saying there is this, uh, you wives, please submit yourselves to your husbands. And really the context here, he says if you've got a, a wife who has an unbelieving husband, uh, without the word of God by a wife's testimony and by a wife's kindness and sweetness and joyfulness and subjecting herself to her husband, that can win him to Christ by being like that. Verse number two, while they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear, whose adorning, let it not be that outward adorning of plating the hair and of wearing of gold or of putting on of apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. For after this manner in the old time, the holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves, being in subjection unto their own husbands, even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are as long as you do well and are not afraid with any amazement. And so right there he makes a, a really a contrast. He says, it's not about the hair, the hairdo, and it's not about the jewelry, and it's not about the clothes you're wearing. Nothing wrong with those things, ladies. Amen. I did read where the Romans used to do their hair. The ladies would do their hair, and it took forever to do it, and they actually would stay up all night. They wouldn't even go to bed because they thought it'll mess up their hairdo. So they would stay up all night as they weaved that, and they weaved gold into it, and did all, all this stuff. Nothing wrong with fixing your hair, nothing wrong with wearing jewelry, nothing wrong uh, with having, uh, you know, dressing nicely, amen on all those things. But the point is, that's not the real beauty. The real beauty is not these outside ornaments, it's the inside ornament. That ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. Now, I'll be honest with you. Um, there's just not a lot of that in the world anymore. There's just, there's just, I don't know, I may be coming from the Western culture and the American culture, but the idea of a woman living unapologetically in subjection to her husband is, you just don't find that much. It's just not a, it's not a thing. That word subjection says there in verse number one, likewise you wives, be in subjection to your own husband. Subjection, uh, it was a, actually, this will fit for our military church, it was a basic sense, had a military relationship in which someone is under a commander. However, in its non-military sense, and this is what it would apply to, it means a voluntary attitude of giving in, a voluntary attitude of cooperating a voluntary attitude of assuming responsibility and carrying a burden. In other words, a righteous wife is to voluntarily give in to her husband, not only in deed, but also in spirit. Um, one writer said, a major, and I think this is so true, a major portion of marriage trouble stems from wives being unwilling to subordinate themselves to the leadership of their husband. Now, uh, what we're preaching tonight and what the Bible says is the exact opposite of what uh, especially Western and American culture teaches. Uh, if you grew up there, and as most of us did, what is <laughs> without question put in your face, if you were a young girl growing up in, in America, is you girl power. You all, it's all about you. Don't let them tell you. You make sure you are loud. You make sure they know who you are. That's the message. I mean, that's the message you get from all uh, Hollywood, all music, all, you know, all of that is sitcoms. It's you establish yourself as in charge, large and in charge, loud. Let them know where you are. And sadly, sadly, this is a part, I think, 
of modern Christianity. In the modern Christian movements, you know what you have? You have women asserting themselves as you, that husband better thank God for you. You better let him know he's got something good. I'm serious. And when we look at the scriptures, the Bible says that's not at all what it's supposed to be. In fact, it's supposed to be quite the opposite. It, what's In the sight of God, what's of great price is a meek and quiet spirit. That's what God um, can, uh, says is, is what's of great price. Uh, <laughs> it's weird how much the culture is so attacking this point, if you stop and think about it. And I think it goes back to God established marriage. I heard a good message and a good thought recently. You know, the first time blood is shed, oh, let me ask you, when was the first time blood was shed in the scripture? What was it? In the garden. When they killed the, huh? Right, right? No. I always thought that. The first time blood was shed was when Adam was cut open and Eve was made. And that's a, that's a covenant. And a covenant is a word meaning a cutting. And there are many covenants. But listen, in the first ever covenant is between man and woman. Wow. I mean, how, I mean out, of, out of all of the covenants, the very first one is Adam and Eve, is man and woman, is husband and wife. How important must marriage, must marriage be? in the sight of the Almighty God. And I think therein lies why we see such an attack upon the family. Where, the, I mean, the whole culture says, never get married. It says, uh, and if you do get married, make sure, she, you make sure she don't own you. You make sure you tell her. And you make sure you let him know that he's got a good, I mean, it's, it's weird like that. So much targeted at marriage, uh, you know. But the Bible has a command here, and, and this is um, a good principle for all of us, not, not just women, uh, uh, wives, and husbands, just all of us, husbands as well. When you find a biblical command, that biblical command should lead to a principle in your life, and that principle should establish a standard of how you live your life. For example here, it says in verse number one, likewise, you wives, be in subjection to your own husbands. That's a command of God. God said that. Uh, so there's your command. Now from that command should come a principle of living. Maybe the principle of be in subjection would be like this. Okay, there's the command to be in subjection to my own husband. Uh, therefore, my principle is I'm not going to disrespect him. I'm, I mean, I'm going to set it on, I'm, that's a principle to not disrespect him. Because that's coming from a command to subject myself to him. So I'm not going to disrespect him. And then that would lead to a standard in your life. And you would maybe come up with this standard. Okay, I'm never going to criticize my husband in a public forum when we're out to eat with friends, or on social media, or on my Twitter account, I'm never going to uh, criticize or talk bad about my husband. That's your standard. Now, you will live by that. But that's a standard that's based on a biblical principle. And that biblical principle is based upon a very plain command. And that's a good way... Uh, that, that we'll all have to grow in the Lord as we study the scriptures when we find a command and God said, this is how I want it done. Then we develop from that a principle of living and then to enforce this principle, we have some standards that are set. Um, you know, it, it, they're all kind of, be ye holy for I am holy. I mean, that's a command. <laughs> that's not to wives or to husbands, that's to all of us. God wants us to be holy. So then there should be a principle out of that that should say something like, 
I need to live my life uh, in a way that pleases God. So my standard might be, I will never watch R-rated movies or whatever, you know what I'm saying? I mean, there's your, because I know that's not going to help me be holy. <laughs> I, I know if I, if I all the time listen to a particular type of music, I realize that's not going to help me be holy. So those are biblical commands which build a principle, which in turn produces a standard of living for our, our lives. And so, um, you know, there's real beauty does not lie in hairdos, clothes, and jewelry. Uh, the most beautiful and expensive clothing for a lady is a meek and quiet spirit. There's something beautiful about a sweet spirit. It does not fade with age. It makes for a wonderful lasting home and marriage relationship. Uh, and I'm just telling you, there's just not a lot of that that goes on today. I think of Mrs. Webster. She was that. Uh, she, she just was. I mean, whatever Pastor Webster said, she said, yes, honey, how can I help you? Even if he was wrong. Even in cases where Pastor Webster was <laughs> making a poor decision, she didn't come in and try to overrule him. She said, yes, honey, let's, I'm with you. I was reading this book, and this is a good book. I would recommend this to all, especially married couples. I would go home and order this on Amazon if you can uh, and get it. It's called Are We There Yet? by Paul and Terry Chapel. And Paul Chapel pastors Lancaster Baptist Church out in uh, Lancaster, California, and he also is the president of West Coast Baptist College, rather rather large school. Um, and he's been in the ministry, I don't know, 30 years. He went out there to out in the middle of the desert, Lancaster, California. I think he had 12 people in his church. And today I think there's something close to like 5,000, uh, and it's out in the middle of the desert. But anyway, they wrote this book, and in the beginning, it's called Are We There Yet? And they wrote and said, listen, we didn't want to write this book until we were older in life you know they, they, we didn't write this book after the first year in the ministry we waited 35 years before we wrote this book and it's, it's a good it's a good read but I want to read to you something that uh, Terry Chapel his wife um, she said she gave five ways a wife can communicate respect to her husband number one give genuine acceptance number two support his decisions Number three, be his recreational partner. Number four, pray for your husband's success. She said this, if I spend my time in prayer for my husband, thinking about how he needs to improve, I will leave my place of prayer with a stronger desire to change him rather than to support him. Conversely, if I spend my time thanking God for his strengths and praying for his successes, I leave prayer with a heart to be a part of those answers. And number five, she said, praise him privately and publicly. In this, uh, she gives a great story, support his decisions. She said they were in Bible college together. They were married in Bible college, and he's working a second shift job, and he hates it. And one of his uh, friends is graduating, and his friend has a uh, uh, window cleaning business. And he tells Paul, he says, Paul, I'll sell you this business for $500. And you can make all kinds of money. And Paul Chapel went to his wife and said, hey, I hate the job that I'm doing. We could make a lot of money on this thing. And let's spend $500 and I'll buy his business. And she said, honey, I don't think that's wise. Uh, we don't know anything about running a business, number one. <laughs> Number two, we kind of need the $500 to pay school bills. I don't think this is a good idea. But, she said, the window washing business won out. <laughs> and so they spent the $500 and got a stack of 3 by 5 notebook uh, cards, no equipment included. He just got, he paid $500 and got a stack of 3 by 5 note cards of clients. So he begins to call every single one of them, and every single one of them says, not interested. I don't want it. No, no. Only one said, I'll let you come clean my windows for free, and then I'll see what kind of a job you do. Well, you know, 
he went and washed the windows for free and never heard from them again, you know. <laughs> so they're out 500 bucks and they got nothing. And she says, I could have said, see, I told you so. But she said, I didn't do that. I supported him the whole way. And she said, we were broke. But she said, but at least we were broke together. And that's true. They went through a tough time, but they went through it together. And she submitted herself and subjected herself and didn't try to overrule, didn't try to come in there and point out how much she knows and all that. She just said, yep, okay, I don't think it's a good idea, but I'm supporting you. And they went forward, and guess what? It failed. And she was glad that she did what God wanted her to do. God wants wives to submit, subject themselves to their husbands. And I think uh, it'll absolutely change our marriages and, um, and, and fix things for the good. Uh, we can be men and women of faith and have tremendous influence over our spouses and our families. Let me ask wives, are you in subjection to your husband? Are you known by a meek and quiet spirit? Uh, that, that's what pleases God. You know, when we, were le when we were in Texas, driving through Amarillo, Texas, on furlough, our van engine light came on. And immediately we pulled off and I opened up the glove and I got out the owner's manual. I began to flip through that thing. I'm looking for, how do I solve this light? What does this mean? Now, as I was looking for what that was, I was looking in the owner's manual, not one time did I think, Probably the person who wrote this owner manual hates me and wants me to just dis destroy my car uh, experience here. No, that owner's manual was written for my good and to help me when things got out of control, that manual was written to help me. This is the manual. God didn't write this to hurt our marriages or to destroy our marriages he he's the one who created marriage and he's the one who said husbands love your wives and he said wives submit yourselves to your husbands see he didn't write that to destroy us he wrote it because he knew it'll help us so the ball gets back on our court doesn't it and it comes to personal choice what are we going to do and i pray that we'll just all choose to habitually, continually work on our marriages. It, there's never going to be a day where, I'm like I said, there's never going to be a time where it's like, yeah, we, we never have. <laughs> we always will. Therefore, we can always be working on it and trying to better please the Lord. Amen. Let's close in prayer. Father, Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the truth that is absolutely contained there. And Lord, it's ours for the taking. Lord, it absolutely and probably you knew this when you wrote it, it would be absolutely opposite of what culture and even, Lord, even Christian culture today. It's exact opposite what you said from what they're saying. Lord, I pray that you would help us to just be Bible believers, humble our hearts. Lord, help us to have a tender heart to the things that you're trying to tell us. And Lord, may we have obedient hearts. We would just do and help husbands to love their wives and help wives to submit to the husbands. And Lord, help us to come together to serve you in these last days that we have. Please bless the invitation we do pray in Jesus' name. Amen.